Efficiently, your body can do that. Some people are genetically lucky. They have a lot of receptors. They can eat almost anything. They're never going to get heart disease. And everybody knows somebody who's 90 years old and they eat, you know, all this fatty food and you kind of look at them and you go, my God, maybe diet really doesn't have much to do with heart disease because look what they're eating. But they're the 90-year-olds. Everyone else died before they got to be that age. They weren't so efficient. You know, that's who you're left with, are the super efficient people. On the other end of the spectrum are people who have heart disease. And in general, they're not as efficient. That's why they have heart disease. They're eating more fat and cholesterol than their body can get rid of. So just cutting from 40 to 30% fat is still too rich for them, and they still get worse. The good news is that even if you're not very efficient at getting rid of fat and cholesterol, if you get the intake down this low, then you're not eating more fat and cholesterol than your body can get rid of. So instead of just trying to get rid of the last meal that you ate, which may indeed be the last meal that you ate, um, <laughs> your body can go to work getting rid of what's been building up in your arteries all these years. And really, that's what Swamiji's whole message has been, at least as I understand it, for all these years that I've been studying with him, which is that your natural state is to be healthy. You don't have to get something to make you healthy. You just have to stop disturbing it. And nowhere is that more true than in heart disease. Because in heart disease, it's not that you're lacking some nutrient or some special thing. It's you just have to find out what you're doing that's disturbing your health and stop doing it. Your body knows how to heal itself. You just have to give it a chance to. If three times a day you're eating more fat and cholesterol than your body can get rid of, it has to go somewhere, so it goes in your arteries. If you just stop doing that, your body can begin to heal. If you're 20, 40 times a day smoking cigarettes, your body can't get rid of them faster than you're putting the nicotine in. If you're under chronic stress and not managing it well, your body never really gets a chance to recover. I, was, I remember 21 years ago or so, we were walking down the street in Chicago. We'd, we'd gone to see Star Wars when it first came out with my older sister. And this little boy came up to him and pulled on his, his robe and said, what are you, a Hindu? And he said, no, I'm an undo. I'm sure you've heard him talk about this before. <laughs> and that's a story that I've told a lot because it's really talking about undoing things rather than doing it. And if you just stop doing the problem, then your body can begin to heal itself. And really much more quickly than we had once thought. You just have to give it a chance to do that. Now, a 10% fat diet is a vegetarian diet. Fruits, vegetables, grains, and beans in their natural forms. That's what you end up with. And we also include uh, non-fat dairy. And for those people who insist on it, egg whites, because it has all the protein and none of the fat. And we exclude all oils, because oils are pure fat. All oils, even olive oil, is 100% fat. And all oils have some saturated fat. So if you're trying to reverse heart disease, all oils you should exclude. Avocados and seeds and nuts are also very high in fat. We allow, but we don't encourage, moderate alcohol consumption. We say it's better to avoid it. In California, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which I always think is such a great combination of things, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> said that the red wine growers could say that red wine is somehow good for your heart. I don't think it's good for your heart, and for reasons we'll talk about. And we don't restrict the amount of food. This is a diet based on the type of food, not the amount of food. So you can eat more and weigh less on a diet like this. Now, this is my favorite magazine. It's called Weekly World News, because they, <laughs> they make up all their stories. The last week's one that I actually uh, gave to President Clinton when we had dinner together the night before last, it said, uh, 12 members of Congress are aliens. <laughs> Did you see that one? <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the congressmen said, yes, we are. What took you so long to find out? <laughs> he got a kick out of that. Anyway, this is Bible prayers, flush out body fat. You don't have to change the way you eat. But in fact, you do have to change the way you eat, but not in the way most people think. If you change the type of food, you don't really have to worry so much about the amount of food. Now, most weight loss diets are based on deprivation, counting calories, restricting portion sizes. And sooner or later, people get tired of feeling hungry and deprived. They get off the diet, they gain the weight back, and then they feel like there was something wrong with them, like they didn't have enough discipline or willpower or motivation. The real problem is they were going about it in the wrong way. If you change what you eat, you don't really have to worry so much about how much you eat. The government came out with a report about two years ago. They looked at all of the different weight loss diets, and what they found is that within a year, two-thirds of the people who lost weight had gained it all back. Within five years, 97% had gained it all back. And their conclusion was, don't even try. You can't do anything. In our study, we found that the average patient lost 25 pounds on our study. And the people who weighed even more lost more than that. You, you lost weight, didn't you, Rudra, on the study? How much did you lose? About 25 pounds. Yeah. And we, weren't even, and we thought, well, gee, maybe they just didn't like the food. You know? Maybe that's why they lost the weight. But we found they were eating more food, and they were eating more frequently. Isn't that what, was, what you were doing also? 
Eating a lot. <laughs> Did people know what you used to do for a living, by the way? <laughs> and delicatessens. <laughs> now, I wasn't talking about that. Anyway, um, the reason that you can eat more and weigh less is that if you shift from a diet that's 40% fat to, the, to one that's 10% fat, even if you eat the same amount of food, you're getting about a third fewer calories. Because fat has nine calories per gram, and protein and carbohydrate have only four. So you can see that even if you eat the same amount of food, if you get the fat down, you're going to be getting a lot less, a lot fewer calories. The second thing is, is that your body converts dietary fat into body fat very easily. Because we've really evolved to deal with deprivation, not abundance. And for the last 100,000 years, the major problem has been getting enough calories, not too many. And so when you, when you cut the amount of food you eat by a third, which is what you do on most weight loss diets, your body thinks you're starving to death. So it says, oh my god, it's famine. So you start burning those calories more slowly. Your metabolism slows down. Which, if you really are starving, can help you live longer. But if you're trying to lose weight, it's enormously frustrating because you stay on the diet, you lose weight at first, and then you plateau even if you stay on it because you're burning those calories more slowly. And when your metabolism slows down, you feel tired and lethargic and depressed, which makes it even harder to stay on a diet. But when you change the type of food you eat, you're not eating less food so your metabolism doesn't slow down. You even have more energy. You feel better. You can think more clearly. And finally, because fruits, vegetables, grains, and beans, as you all know, are very bulky and high in fiber, they tend to fill you up before you get too many calories. Now, this is a man who came to one of our retreats. We have week-long <laughs> retreats that, that uh, uh, Amrita and Divyananda and, and other people have worked at and continue to work at. And, and we do everything on a nonprofit basis, just like the ashram does. This is a man whose name is Hal Patinkin. He'll actually be on the Oprah show if you happen to watch it. He came in for it. And Hal is Mandy Patinkin's uncle, the actor, who you may know. And Hal is a, uh, was told that he needed to have bypass surgery. He came across my book in a bookstore two days before his operation, and he read it. He said, I'm going to do this instead of having a bypass. And his wife and his doctor told him he was going to be dead if he didn't have the, the operation. So he called me, and he came to our retreat, and I talked with his doctor, and I said, let's, let's work out an agreement. He's not going to die in the next three months, do you think? And they said, no. I said, so why don't you give him a PET scan, and we'll see how much blood flow his heart is getting. And then three months later, do it again. And if he's worse, I'd be the first one to say he should have a bypass. But if he's better, maybe he doesn't need one. So we all agreed. So turn the lights off just again. This is his before picture. And oh, no, this is not his after picture. Um, these are his uh, cows. He's a uh, cattle rancher. He raises 450 Red Angus cattle. And this is his after picture. He lost a lot of weight. But more importantly, not only did he lose weight, his heart disease improved. His PET scan was better. And I'll show you his PET scan in a minute. So he still raises his cattle. He just doesn't eat them anymore. <laughs> now the cartoon says, I think you've crossed the line from seasoning to herbal medicine. <laughs> and uh, we've, 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 <laughs> we've learned what makes low-fat food taste good. And we've learned that if we can commission really great chefs, some of the country's you know, most well-known chefs, I'd say the creme de la creme, but that would be the wrong metaphor here, <laughs> um, to make the food, like Wolfgang Puck and Deborah Madison and Joyce Goldstein and Alice Waters and Hubert Keller and Brad Ogden, people like that, then the food can be delicious and beautifully presented as well as being helpful. So we make spinach pasta, and uh, I'm sure you've had this here, pizza without the cheese and the oil and butter, things that are familiar and yet taste good. I've also been working with, uh, well, that's, this is something different, the first two studies were done in Texas, and sometimes people say, oh, you know, you live in California, it's an altered state, you know, they'll do anything there. But the first two studies were, were done in Texas, and one of the patients came in on the first day wearing these boots. It was like God's little joke, because he'd won the Trilingua Chili Festival. Trilingua was like the Super Bowl of chili cook-offs, and he won it with his buzzard's breath chili, <laughs> which I've tasted, and it really lives up to its name. And, he had these boots made to commemorate his great victory, being a good Texan. I just show this to say this is a marked change in his way of eating. He's now mentioning a vegetarian chili that's really quite good. And the cartoon says, our fridge stays full of nutritious, low-fat food because we usually end up ordering pizza. <laughs> so as a result, because of that, I've been working with a company called ConAgra to develop a new line of foods called Life Choice. These are the people who make Healthy Choice. And Life Choice are vegetarian, very low-fat meals with virtually no cholesterol, 
that are familiar, vegetable enchiladas and black bean burritos and manicotti and linguine and things like that. And they're available now by FedEx. They'll FedEx them anywhere in the country. And I've been working with them to try to get them in the supermarkets, and that's still an ongoing saga. Uh, the stress uh, factor is important in heart disease. Stress makes plaque build up in your arteries more quickly. This is a study of monkeys. They took monkeys and they divided them into two groups. They put them on the same diet. One group of monkeys they put under stress by every so often they'd introduce a new monkey into the cage. And monkeys, unlike humans, are very hierarchical and they need to know where they are on the uh, totem pole. And so they would, they would get in fights with each other to figure out who was the top monkey and who was the bottom monkey. And that was very stressful for the monkeys. And they ended up having over twice as much blockage in their arteries as the unstressed monkeys, even though they're genetically comparable and on the same diet. So stress makes blockages build up in your arteries more quickly. So we teach people how to be in the same environment but to react to it differently. So often people think you have to choose between am I going to just have to retire, doctor, you know, or am I going to have to keep, can I keep working and, and, but I'm going to get a heart attack. That isn't a choice. And one of the things that Swamiji has always said and put by his own example is that hard work is not bad for you. It's the attitude that you bring to it. And if you bring a dispassionate attitude, if you bring a non-attached attitude, especially if you view yourself as an instrument working for a higher purpose, then you don't get stressed when you do it, not nearly as much. So we teach people how they can do that. The cartoon says, you stop to smell the flowers? What the hell kind of excuse is that? <laughs> that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the, uh, <laughs> that's what many people think about stress. And, and the boss here, Mr. Jones, was always in a hurry, always rushing, never took time to relax because he didn't want people to think of him as, a, as being late, as a late person. And unfortunately, he got a heart attack and died and was then after known as the late Mr. Jones. <laughs> okay, okay. It says they want yogurt, Hilda. Yogurt, not yoga. <laughs> and this was in the New Yorker a few months ago. You might have seen that. Um, <laughs> and so we teach people the so-called stress management techniques, which we call yoga, various hatha yoga, pranayama, raja yoga, japa, imagery, which is a type of raja yoga, uh, progressive deep relaxation, and group support. Here's some of our patients doing their uh, stretching exercises, their, their hatha. You, may, you know this person here. And you'll notice this man here is looking at his watch during the yoga class, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. We, I didn't even notice that until after I took the picture. Uh, not everybody does it perfectly, but many people do. This man here is now 80 years old, uh, or will be 80 years old in a few months. And he showed more reversal than anybody because he, he changed more than anybody. So it wasn't really how old or how sick they were. It was mainly how much they changed. The cartoon says, nothing happens next. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, People have so many misconceptions about meditation. Now, I don't have to tell you all what meditation is, but what I've learned is helpful in, in, is, first of all, that we teach people how to meditate, as I've learned from, from Sri Swamiji, in a way that's consistent with their own belief system, with their own religion, with their own culture, and to find a way to do that. And that's, you know, again, so many things that I've learned from, from being here and studying with him over the years. And I think that's one of the most important is work within the belief system of someone because they all of course, take you to the same place. And to tell people that meditation is not about withdrawing from the world, it's about embracing it more fully. You know, as Swamiji has said many times, yoga is not about standing on your head, it's about standing on your feet. And using examples of athletes. And, and I'm giving you these examples not because you don't know what meditation is, but in your teaching of it, I found these to be helpful. You may, and you may also. You know, you know world-class athletes, at a world-class level, the difference in physical ability is negligible. Boris Becker, the tennis player, has said many times, the difference between number one tennis player and number 100 is negligible in terms of their physical abilities. But it's mental at that level. If you saw the Winter Olympics, Dan Jansen, the Olympic speed skater, he kept choking and, and, and never won. Even though everybody said he was physically the best skater, he got a psychologist who, among other things, taught him how to meditate, won a gold medal. Also, meditation is not about withdrawing from the world, even on a sensual level whether it's food or sex or music or art or massage or anything that involves your senses, when you really pay attention to what you're doing, it, doing, you can enjoy it a lot more fully. And you don't need as much of it to enjoy. In food, for example, if you really pay attention to what you're eating, you don't have to eat as much to get that same sensual gratification. 
And we've all had the experience of the opposite. If, if you eat while you watch TV or read or talk to someone and you look down and the food's gone and you hardly taste it, has it ever happened to you? You know, that's the opposite of eating with awareness. If you really pay attention, you don't need to eat as much. You become aware when you've had enough. You don't have to realize that your pants don't fit anymore before you uh, realize you had enough. And you also pay attention to the s more subtle qualities of the food, the, the rajasic or tamasic or sattva qualities. If you eat a lot of fat, you feel kind of tamasic. You feel dull. You feel tired and lethargic. You don't feel so good. You eat this way, you feel more energized. You feel better. You can think more clearly. You just feel better. If you have heart disease, your chest pain goes away. You pay attention to those more subtle cues, and then that really becomes what helps sustain this, not because someone else told you to do it, but because your own experience tells you that. And then, of course, we teach meditation as a way of quieting down the mind and body to experience more of an inner sense of peace and joy and well-being, which you're all familiar with. This is from uh, Dr. Karen Olness, who works with patients and teaches patients with warts how to meditate, did a study. This is obviously someone who has warts. Six weeks later, after meditating, the warts are gone. Same patient. Now, does that mean you can just meditate away anything? Well, probably not, at least not in my experience. But does it mean that your mind affects your body to a much greater degree than we had once thought? And clearly, I think the answer is yes. We also teach people visualization. And this is also something that I learned from Swamiji. And that is, we, we draw pictures showing where their arteries are, where the blockages are. We ask them to visualize the arteries becoming less blocked, the heart beating more normally, the blood flow improving. And they do that pretty well. These are very competitive people. They were comparing even their angiograms to see his words. <laughs> and the cartoon says, there are 5,000 languages on Earth, and we can't find one that we both understand. And she goes, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> so we, <laughs> we teach people communication skills, how to talk to each other in ways that don't feel so much like attacks and judgments. And these are things that are outlined in my books. We teach people how to exercise, but one of the things that Swamiji has also said is you don't have to kill yourself to be healthy. You know, just moderate exercise is enough. Walking 20 or 30 minutes a day, you know, and not even all that fast. And if you look at studies, they show that if you look at risk of death by level of exercise, with group five being the marathon runners, group one being the couch potatoes who never exercised, and group two are the people who walk 20 or 30 minutes a day, or in some studies, even just gardening. You can see that if this is premature death rate, the greatest reduction in premature death goes from doing nothing to almost anything. And with increasing levels of, <laughs> seriously, and with increasing levels of exercise, you get a little bit more benefit, but not a lot. And the risk of dying during exercise or getting hurt during exercise is directly related to the intensity. So moderate exercise, I think, gives you most of the benefits while reducing the risks. I've been collecting old cigarette ads. These are actual advertisements from about 60 years ago. Doctors were advertising cigarettes. 20,000 physicians say, smoke luckies. They're less irritating. Can you imagine? More doc oh, not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Well, that's probably true. There, there are millions. Um, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarettes. Can you imagine? According to a survey. And my favorite one is why many leading ear, nose, and throat specialists suggest change to Philip Morris. Now, can you imagine? I mean, being in an ear, nose, and throat convention, I think they should be smoking camels. No, I think they should be smoking Philip Morris, you know. But the point is, is that 60 years ago, you'd be a radical. You'd be a, it's at best a square, not very cool, not very hip, and at worst a radical, on the, a health nut on the fringe to say people shouldn't be smoking. One of the things that I just found so wonderful about, about uh, Sri Swamiji when he first came over here was that when I first went to yoga retreats in Montecito in 1972, you know, he wasn't talking about you know, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, as much as he was saying, look, you got to quit smoking. You know, I just thought that was wonderful, you know, because back then it wasn't so popular to say as it is now. You know, deal with that first. You can't worry about finding God if you're smoking all the time. You know, you're going to be in the hospital. And so whether something is considered radical or conservative really depends on, on how much we learn and how much we know. Now things are changing, not only with smoking, but our program is now being used by more and more hospitals, which I'll talk more about in a moment. I had a, by the way, I had a, a call from a surgeon, a cardiac surgeon in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. This is not the cutting edge of radical thought. And he said, he said, whenever I operate on someone, I give them a copy of your book because I don't want to have to operate on them twice. Because it's, you know, I feel like I've failed if, if the operation doesn't last. And every time you have to go into someone who's already been operated on once, there's all this scar tissue and adhesions and it's twice the mortality rate. It's, you know, not fun for them and it's not fun for me. So would you come talk to some of my patients? And I said, sure. So I went and 
over 2,000 people that he'd operated on came to, to the lecture. So that's how things are changing now. It's really rewarding. Wow. And the, the, uh, the cartoon says, I give smokers a discount because there's not as much to tell. And <laughs> 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 And I show the slide to uh, emphasize that we're learning what really, what really works and what doesn't work to motivate changes in lifestyle. You can turn the lights on for just a minute. The, um, what we've learned, first of all, is that paradoxically, and this is also something that I learned from coming here, that it's easier to make big changes than to make small ones. You know, the conventional wisdom is that small gradual changes are easy and big rapid changes are hard. Isn't that what you've always heard? But it's wrong. And this is something that Sri Swamiji taught me. Because when you only make small gradual changes, you get the worst of both worlds. You have the sense of deprivation because you're not getting to eat or do everything that you really want, but you're not making changes big enough to get much benefit. Your cholesterol doesn't come down very much, as I mentioned earlier, your blood pressure, your weight don't come down. If you lose weight, you gain it back. Worst of all, if you have heart disease, the heart disease gets worse over time. So you have the hassle and deprivation, but you don't really get much to show for it. When you make comprehensive changes, as you all know from being here, you feel so much better so quickly, whether you have heart disease or not, the choices become much clearer and for many people they're worth making. Not to live longer, but to live better. You know, none of us knows how long we have to live. We may live to be 90, we may get hit by a truck, you never know. But what people in our study have said over and over is that even if it turned out they didn't have heart disease, they would still stay with it because it's improved the quality of life so much. And that's important because otherwise people say, well, I don't care if I live to be, you know, living to be 86 instead of 85 doesn't really motivate most people.